Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Our podcasts are made possible in part by corporate sponsor, Store My Tumor. I have metastatic cancer, and uh, so far I've been pretty good, mm-hmm. but I am determined to walk the, walk the talk that I'm telling everybody else. I'm trying to fill my life with as much wonder and beauty as I can. It's not happenstance that your life is so rich. It is... You know, I really believe in the power of the universe and what you have cultivated in your mindset and positivity and attitude. I know I have a strong life force and uh, I think I'm going to be around for a while, so I'm going to hold on to that. In this episode, we talk about the power of art as a healing tool. We talk about everything from singing bowls and the power of song and music and vibration to the power of curiosity, wonder, and joy. Welcome to the conversation. I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to contribute to your wonderful website and the work you're doing. Oh, thank you, that means a lot. One one of the features of going through this experience uh, is the false notion that you're alone. Yes. Uh, Even though you pull that mantle around yourself all the time. <clears throat> even even now, I still do, uh, mm-hmm. 10 or 12 years after my first experience with it. So you have to remind yourself that there are lots of people out there going through something similar. Exactly. And I think even in your experience in the last decade or so, I mean, the way technology has evolved, you know, it used to be meeting up in person and looking towards your local communities for that support. And now being able to go online and using technology to connect with people all over the globe has really changed the way we're talking about breast cancer and community. Oh, yes. There's the psychological feature and then all the changes in medicine Mm -hmm. uh, and the movement, which I think is really significant, of the two areas of uh, holistic or alternative um, medicine and traditional medicine so that uh, I think there is an integrative medicine emerging at least over the last decade. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I just got a book from Amazon actually called Lifestyle Medicine, and it was written by a few different doctors as a compilation. And I haven't started reading through it yet, but just paging through the table of contents. And I totally agree that there's, with the, with the integrative medicine and the holistic approach, they're really trying to professionalize it as a complement to traditional care. Yeah, even the way they're distributing chemo now, Laura, uh, my girlfriend a a couple blocks away went through uh, at at Langone uh, this series of what they called infusions where you put your feet up and you can get reflexology and Mm. uh, there's music and you're in your own little cubicle. When I got chemo, it was, you know, the, a, a circle of feet coming yeah. out of the Barca loungers. Mm-hmm. And we had a nurse who used to do uh, comic routines for the eight of us um, with our feet as kind of the, 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 the setup stage. Yeah. And it was not so nice. She was the one uh, feature that uh, made it palatable. She made us laugh. So, um, I have my own feelings about chemo that uh, I'm, I'm, I hope never to have to have it again. Uh, but what, one doesn't know, of course. But there's so many other changes. Uh, n- the importance of nutrition, for example, is a major factor. And of attitude, too. Uh, oh, absolutely. Radical Remission is a book that you might jot down and the readers, too, about, uh, um, I'm, I'm, forgive me, the author's name escapes me now but it's it was a bestseller and it's about uh these approaches to he- healing um stage four cancer in particular and uh some of them are understandable like nutrition but others like attitude 
prayer, mm. uh, spiritual exercises, are rather surprising. Uh, and yet these are uh, documented ways of curing oneself of cancer. Not necessarily breast cancer, but that's included. So it, it, the world is different now from 2007 uh, when I <clears throat> was diagnosed with stage 2A breast cancer um, and went through quite a year, ending up with uh, marrying my present husband. I was 62 when I met him, Laura. Yeah. So uh, I'm getting out there <laughs> to uh, <laughs> now, did aging you Cinderella's. Him? Did you meet him before uh, your diagnosis or after your diagnosis? This, is, this was after the diagnosis. And, um, uh, it, it, well, it's, it's a little bit of a story. I, I uh, tell it in uh, my book, which is a memoir about getting through cancer. It's called Side Effects, The Art of Surviving Cancer by Dr. Carol Weaver. Yeah, I, I was dating him and got the diagnosis. Okay. And for the year of 2007, <clears throat> he was there. But uh, my husband, my boyfriend at the time, had a real problem with being around sick people. Mm. Do you know the term empath, E-M-P-A-T-H? Uh, my, my husband is an empath. Okay. He went to med medical school, but he couldn't practice because sick people drained all the energy out of him. Okay. So, though he loved me and still does, uh, I couldn't get a lot of support from him. And uh, as your readers know, to get through uh, the process of treatment, is you really need a village. Mm -hmm. You need friends and family. Uh, support group if you have it. Uh, I was I found myself rather bereft of those. My family was in California, and uh, at that point there weren't a lot of support groups around. I think my chemo group was the closest to that, and I didn't see them all the time. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, so what I ended up doing, I leaned on my girlfriend. Doesn't everybody? Yep, for sure. That's what we do. So I kind of exhausted them. Uh, so what I turned out doing, and that's in the book, is I, I found art to be the, the uh, resource for energy, distraction, uh, perspective, um, and comfort. Yeah. No, so the book talks talks about about 13 objects, very unusual objects, because I didn't know anything about art. I mean, right. I, I went, went to graduate school, but I didn't know, I, I'm a literature person. Sure. So, and, uh, and it worked. So because of, of that discovery, uh, I really believe that art heals, uh, mm -hmm. that art is a way of of getting your body back to balance. And then I discovered that there's a lot of science behind it. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me so, more about that? Like in terms of art, I know you were gracious enough to share on our blog about using art as healing. And in this podcast too, at the end for our listeners, I'll also link out to your book if they wanted to find out more information about it. But when you talk about art as healing, is it more about like practicing art and using like drawing and painting as a therapy or is it visual where you're attracted to a piece of art like if you were at an antique show or museums? What a great question. Um, that's one I'm still wrestling with. I, I have friends who are art therapists. Okay. I am not an art therapist. Yes, I have a friend named Marilyn who uh, she does magical things with singing. She believes that Singing is an art form that brings health. One quick example, we went to a senior uh, art fair. And, and I should tell your listeners that I'm, I'm a, a remarkable 75-year-old. Oh, congratulations. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Just had a big, big party last October. Um, and Marilyn got a woman who does not speak. She has Alzheimer's. She's in the neighborhood. I've seen her with her daughter-in-law walking around and uh, Marilyn sang what a wonderful world and then gave 
the lyrics to this woman. And I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be a disaster. She doesn't even speak, much less sing. Mm -hmm. But Marilyn had this microphone, Laura, that looked like something out of a Frank Sinatra movie. You know, the big thing with the black stuff around it. Yes. Very impressive. And she gave it to the woman with the lyrics. The woman sang What a Wonderful World all the way through. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Uh, there were about 20 people witnessing this. So there's no question that she may have not been able to recognize a friend, but she knew how to sing the, the lyrics to that song. And there's a lot of science. Uh, Oliver Sacks, a neurophysiologist who just died, uh, was convinced that Alzheimer patients could remember the lyrics to a Frank Sinatra song but could not recognize their son because those lyrics were in the brain. Mm -hmm. They were permanently in the brain as a frequency since the time they were 12 years old. Yeah. And uh, so for Alzheimer patients, music can bring their personality back to them at least temporarily. Wow, that's an incredible story. Yeah. Now, that's a music therapist, but as you put it very well, I am uh, not that. I believe, though, that it, reacting to art, just expressing your, uh, your reaction to art has a, a tremendous uh, impact. Now, you know, uh, the Tibetans, 500 years before Christ, used the Tibetan singing bowls. Yes. As a form of therapy. You know, I'm going back to therapy. Have you ever heard of Tibetan singing bowl? You know, I'm about to go grab mine. I do. Oh, you have one. Oh, great. Yes, so do I. Exactly. Mine is downstairs. Yes, right here. We have them. Oh, <laughs> that, that is wonderful. Um, I, I'd like you even more. Uh, I usually bring them to my talks, and uh, people just love them. Well, it's the alpha, as you probably know, it's the alpha, theta, delta waves that they are stimulating in, in our chest. It feels as if it's in our chest because you're not just hearing the Tibetan singing bowl, you're feeling it. Yes. And the Tibetans felt that that could bring the individual back to balance mm. and it, the, the process of healing could start. Now, I suppose that's a kind of therapy, and you're asking me about my own uh, experience when I was going through breast cancer. Well, I always tell my audiences, and I, I have really started a small business on art and healing, speaking about this to, uh, to groups. I say the first thing that people should do when they're pursuing this version of uh, art and healing that I did, which is very modest, it, it's not really becoming a, an art therapist, is when you see something that's beautiful, it gives you energy. You know, like if you go to a museum and you see something that you like, buy the postcard. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because the first, the first impact is E, energy. The second one is perspective. Um, I was very fond of looking at Chinese slippers. Have you ever seen they're, they're, have you ever seen them? They're very ornate and they cover the mutilated feet of children and women because the Chinese had this barbaric custom of breaking the foot to make it small. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, but the slippers are absolutely gorgeous. And I started reading about them and how that was a way of making up for this terribly violent thing. So the perspective of where the art came from, uh, Vermeer in the, in the uh, 17th century, he died because he couldn't feed his children. He kept yeah, having children. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so at 36, he had like 12 children and he couldn't paint fast enough. Um, so his wife said he was okay one day and then he went into his bed and he just 
He just expired. Oh. So his beautiful paintings, and we only have a few, are there despite the fact that he was painting really as, as desperately as he could. Mm -hmm. uh, Picasso's blue period, that's all he could afford was the blue paint. You get a perspective on these artists, these people, these human beings who suffered and yet still made beautiful, beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing is in, in an intense uh, identification with the with the artist, um, understanding them and realizing that that like you, they also suffered. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, to the, the the work of art can make you inspired to create. So it's EPIC that I'm telling my audiences. Uh, after a while, when you look at a beautiful work of art, your fingers might start itching to go to the piano mm -hmm. or to pick up a paintbrush. So that's a long way of answering the question. I'm not an art therapist. Uh, I recommend that you investigate one because I think they do a lot of good. But you can also gain great um, strength, perspective, philosophy, and, and a comfort mm -hmm. from looking at and discovering, really, what you like. And that's a large part of my book is don't let a music teacher or a, a museum director tell you what's good. Mm -hmm. You discover it yourself. Exactly. I love oh. that. You bring up so many great points. And I know you didn't talk about um, crystals at all, but since we were talking about like the singing bowls and the wave frequencies, um, we have so much in common. I just started also <laughs> meditating with various crystals and like, very basic, like the very common ones like quartz or um, I'm blanking on some of the other names of the crystals that I have. But again, people are asking, like, how do you know which ones give you energy? How do you know which ones are right for you? And my simple answer is when you go to the store or you're looking online or you happen to be in Sedona, Arizona, where, you know, you can't go two feet without running into some. But it's whatever your eye is drawn to, right? Like there's some sort of connection. There's some sort of energy there. And I think that really resonates with what you're saying in terms of walking into a museum or looking at pieces of art. There's something there that grabs you that attracts you yes absolutely you, you, you you're echoing what i just did at the rockland center for the arts on sunday i uh, i was invited to come in and talk about my book but i i did for a couple of minutes but what i did that was more fun uh i had a powerpoint of 15 very different works of art um you know the picasso's um uh, uh, goat, that sort of thing, and maybe a, a, a maritime scene with two boats in a storm. Um, I had a lot of abstract pieces, and I just asked the audience, I said, look, we're going to do this really silly, simple exercise. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the picture up, and you're going to tell me whether you like it or not. And you know they enjoyed that so much. It was not a consensus. Everybody had different likes. Um, you know, there would be two or three people who, who liked the Picasso of the woman with the baby over her head. Mm -hmm. And then everybody liked, um, what was it now? I'm trying to think. It was, I think it was um, an Elvis picture um, that uh, Andy Warhol had done. So, you, you know, it was, it was surprising. But I could tell that it was a good exercise because... People are not asked what do you like very mm -hmm. much. They they but the, and they forget. So I always say take down those old things in your cubicle and put up even something from a magazine. It doesn't have to be uh, an authentic etching or anything like that. My husband's an art appraiser, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of art objects in the house. But he always says when people ask him what should I buy. Of, as a work of art, he always says, "Buy what you like. Mm -hmm. Buy what you like." Uh, and I think that that does feed the system. There, there's science now. Laura, do you know they found that works of art in hospitals shorten the hospital stay? Really? Uh, in other yes, 
and they and people who have the right kind of art in their hospital rooms, they take less medicine. They oh, get out wow. of the hospital sooner, and they're happier with their treatment. There's been so much uh, work done in this area that if you Google art and health or art and hospitals, you'll find dozens of articles. You know, you're too young to know this. But I remember hospitals being very dull, austere places. Um, sometimes there wouldn't be enough paint on the walls. When I had my son James, who's 38, uh, in Brooklyn, it was a horrible room. Now you go into hospitals, you can't walk anywhere without seeing uh, paintings on the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's because they've learned customer service. <laughs> yes. They found out, and here's an interesting little pattern. They found out uh, when they asked, this was a, a study done in Italy, when, or with, with an Italian partner, also American hospitals, um, when they asked them, what kind of paintings do you like of the patients now, after they stayed a while in the hospital, and they were um, shown a, a variety of paintings, do you like scenes of everyday life? Do you like portraits? Do you like abstract paintings? Uh, or do you like uh, landscapes? Mm. What was the answer? What do you think the answer was? What was their favorite? Maybe landscapes? That would be my guess. You're so smart. You're, you're too smart. <laughs> yes. They, and the one they hated the most? Um, the portrait? I'm not sure. That's what I thought. <clears throat> they didn't want to be reminded of the people they who weren't there. Right. No, they hated the abstract. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting? And I thought about this. I think it made them anxious because they didn't know what it meant. Sure, sure. <laughs> so they're in bed and they're worried about their health. What do they want to look at? They want to look at nature. And they didn't like nature red and eye and tongue. They didn't want to see storms. Right. They wanted to see peaceful spring-like days, like a Corot or, you know, some yeah. sort yeah, of that generic makes so much sense. mountainside like, or something. Exactly. The and, you Isn't know, that funny? But, but it, it, clearly, there is something going on here when hospitals will spend that much money on artwork, not just in the, in the rooms of the patients, but all along the corridors. Yes, very true. Because they want they want that impact of the, the, you know science. The science of art and healing is my particular beat. Mm -hmm. um, I I collect these articles. Um, Michael uh, Mitchell Gaynor, who another one who just passed away, cured pancreatic cancer with Tibetan singing bowls. Laura. Wow. That's, yeah. I mean, this is, I know this sounds woo woo, but there is, there is science to, to this. You can actually yeah. look him up. No, I completely uh, believe well, it. If I can actually. Mitchell Gaynor. Yeah, Mitchell Gaynor. I'll, I'll look him up and I completely believe the science around the singing bowls. I was recently researching the power <laughs> of, have you heard of gong baths? These like Chinese gongs that you can, um, you know, different sizes no, and you I... have different tones. But it sounds very similar because um, I know the singing bowls also come in different sizes and different tonalities. And there, I think it was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'm sure there's others throughout the United States. But there's these gong baths where you pretty much go and you're lying on a yoga mat for about 90 minutes and they play these gongs for you as like a meditation. Yes. And it's supposed to say like these, the vibrations of those sounds, similar to what you were mentioning with... Um, the alpha and beta and delta waves, these vibrations are supposed to trigger the healthy cells to rejuvenate faster, I believe. Um, you know, I'll have to go back to my notes and see exactly what the science was. But at first I was reading this, I was like, I don't know, this doesn't sound, you know, I'm not used to it, right? It's new to me. Um, should I believe it or not? But you're right, you go out and you see some of the science behind the power of these, these tones and how it really, how your body has a physical reaction to it. Absolutely. Um, I, I saw something. How do you spell gong bat? I'm going to look that up. So it's G-O-N-G-B. 
Yep, gong, G-O-N-G, and then bath, B-A-T-H. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Um, I a, a couple of months ago, I went to uh, a, a Tibetan bowl <clears throat> demonstration by this expert. She brought about 40 of these bowls of all different sizes, and and uh, we did the same thing. We, we, we were on a mat. Uh, people really bought elaborate things to, to lie on because they'd done it before. Okay. And for 45 minutes, she played these these gorgeous bowls, and... It was wow. remarkable. Well, there's a whole science called somatics uh, mm. that you can look at online. And the principle of it is that we are uh, we are affected by sound. You, they, they will put sand on a glass plate and then play music underneath. And the sand changes in, sh- in sh- these shapes emerge. Mm. Um, and so you, you can see that sound does have an effect on that. And then there's a very famous guy whose name I forget, who does this with water, that water reacts to uh, music and, and to this kind of sound, uh, the, the, the t- tonality of the bowls or the gong bath. And we're, after all, we're three quarters water. Mm-hmm. So why, why wouldn't sound affect us? Um, mm. I, my, one of my favorite uh, stories, I mean, this is just a theory, <clears> that you know that the great symphonic conductors like Toscanini, they lived so long, and people say, oh, it's because of the cardiovascular thing. You know, they're waving their arms around all the time, so their their heart is getting exercise. So that that makes them live into their nineties. Well, my theory is that all that beautiful music that Mahler and Mendelssohn is pouring over them. For 20, 30 years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's why they live a long time. I mean, maybe the exercise helps a little bit. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a very good reason why we should have the music that we love around us uh, to to do that. Um, yeah, but then, you know, th- then there are the visuals, Laura, um, that beauty as in the hospital uh, situation mm-hmm. <clears throat> right now i'm i'm really really interested in uh, wonder in uh, the way you feel i don't know if you're into magic but i really love uh, a really good ma- a magician and not to look at online but to be there in the audience right um, last summer i was Lucky enough to see <clears throat> Nick Stancarone. He's pretty famous. He's written a book called This Is Real Magic. And he was about 10 feet from, I mean, well, it wasn't Nick Stancarone, actually. It was another art, another magician. He was so good. I felt in these, quote, tricks, which were really more than tricks. I mean, they were just incredible. Huh. Um, to pulling needles out of his mouth and then pulling a string, putting a string in, and the, the needles came out threaded, 10 of them. I mean, Interesting. Just, oh, my God. You have to see it. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, wonder is a little different from experiencing beauty, but it's related. Huh. And I think wonder is the most powerful emotion that we can have to bring us to health. Um, and I'm going to quote another study. I hope you forgive me. You just can st- stop me if I'm no, going. No, this is so or fascinating. There was a study done at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, this is kind of a strange study. And you would say, oh, that's Berkeley, that's California. But these were very sober uh, physicians who wanted to know what the effect of certain kinds of experiences were on the immune system. So they took a group of people, I think these were seniors, I have to check the article again, and they brought them to the Grand Canyon. Mm. They had not seen the Grand Canyon before, apparently. So they swabbed their mouths and did a baseline and then let them out there to look at the Grand Canyon for about an hour. And they brought them back in and they found that the blood had changed, that the 
cytokines, the good cytokines, had increased hmm. over the course of an hour, which meant that these are the soldiers of the immune system. Okay. So the conclusion of this article was, and they included music and beauty, but they said that wonder, which is what they had, they all talked about, mm -hmm. you know, this monument of strangeness, the oddness of nature, what, you know, what, what a cosmic surprise. It helps us live longer. Hmm. So I'm looking for wonder. Yes. And do you mind <laughs> I'm elaborating? Can I ask you to elaborate a little bit on like how you define wonder? So I'm thinking like for me, this is fascinating. I haven't heard about this before is like wonder is like a very powerful emotion. And I'm I'm thinking like, oh, okay, does wonder mean like curiosity or like how do you explore something? And But how, how do you, it sounds much more powerful than that. How do you define wonder? Oh, what a great question. I'm, I'm this is what, one of the things I'm working on. Well, Nick Stankerone in his book <clears throat> says that it's getting out of the ordinary. You discover something mm -hmm. that changes your world view. You know, we're always sitting there with the list. I got to get this done, then I got to get this done. Then I yes, yes. <laughs> but, but, but wonder is saying, oh my God, mm. I'm alive and I'm here to see this amazing, not trickery, but this amazing way of changing reality. Yes. So it's it's the opposite to reality, and mm -hmm. it's it is a discovery, as you say. But you know what I use as my definition because I haven't even seen the Grand Canyon. Oh, I mean, no? I've seen it on television, sure. but when I went to the doctors, uh, the pediatrician, with my first and only grandson, he was two and a half, and I went into with his mother, and we came out of the office, and it, you know, of course, it's a place for kids so it's got it had it had this little tiny machine well you know where you turn the crank and the thing comes out yes mm -hmm. uh, and and the and it was built for his height and the things inside were these transparent balls and in the inside was a little car hmm. well he had never seen anything like this so i went over to the to the machine with him. I asked his mother if it was okay. And you didn't have to put a coin in or anything. Mm -hmm. You just had to stand in front of it and turn the crank and out of the little um, uh, opening slot came this thing. So I said, Mac, hold your hand underneath. Mm -hmm. We turned the slot. And when it came out and he held it, his entire body shook. Wow. He was in he was in wonder. Yeah. He, he had never yeah. seen anything like that. It, and I shook with him. Mm -hmm. Because I was I, I was vicariously understanding this was the most glorious thing. Look, a little toy comes and it's in a little box. And you open the little box and there it is. What a wonder. Mm. <laughs> Completely. Thank you for thank you for telling that story. Yes, no, um, I love that. And you have to get to the Grand Canyon. I that's when people ask oh, me, me like what your favorite place on earth is. It's amazing. Um, you know, you can travel the world and see amazing, you know, architectural wonders of the world. They call them right. And yeah, I, it was in 2011. I went for the very first time to the Grand Canyon and have been back one additional time. But anytime anyone ever wants to go, I will be on a plane with them going. It is honestly one of my favorite places in the world because of the beauty oh. and the magnificentness of it and so yeah i hope you do get to get there sometime and you know maybe you and your family from california can meet there well so. i thank you so much and i think you know laura i have metastatic cancer and uh so far i've been pretty good mm -hmm. but i am determined to walk the walk the talk that I'm telling everybody else. I'm trying to fill my life with as much wonder and beauty as I can. 
it seems to be working so far. Excellent. But, um, yes. <laughs> I, and I'm writing about this, too. I'm also writing about how to handle this diagnosis and still, you know, in, enjoy life. But there, there isn't any question that I'm convinced that art can heal. Mm -hmm. When I have to have blood drawn, uh, as, we, as you all know, you know, when we're being watched, that happens a lot. Yes. Um, I always look at a picture of my three, now three-year-old grandson. Mm. Um, I just look at the picture of him on my phone, and I can feel the difference in what's happening in, in my body, that there's something rushing to, mm -hmm. rushing to help. So that's what I would, I would tell my, my listeners or readers, um, is, is to really take that seriously. We get too caught up in the ordinary, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be reminded, whether you believe in, in a deity or not, there's so much to enjoy and to savor in life. Don't miss it. Yes. Um, don't yeah. miss it. And, you know, even recommendations, not even recommendations, but I, I'm, I, I, I've done some acting in my life, and I think I... I have the gift of like standing above my grandson. Mm -hmm. I feel I have the gift of feeling other people's excitement and uh, pleasure as I did yours mm -hmm. just then. Thank you. Uh, so what, if you can't travel, at least be around people who, who can tell you what it's like or watch it yes. on, uh, on television or Netflix. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's right. Oh, and I think, yeah. you know, there's a story I'd also like to share with you. Um, you have so many great points. I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, you know, we talk a lot about joy. And, you know, I think I quote a lot in our social media and on our blogs, like, do what makes you happy and do what brings you joy. And having this conversation with you, you know, I think deepens that comment because it's so easy to say yes, like, do what makes you happy. Like, it's a simple statement. Um, right. But when you're describing looking at the photo of your grandson, like that is joy, right? That is actually yes. being mindful and right. present in the moment and really just saying, you know, it's it's one thing to say, yes, the sun is shining and this is a beautiful day and I'm happy. But like what actually has that emotional and physical change and yeah. energy in your body, I think we need to be aware of too, like what gives us that strength. So I thank you for sharing that. I did. Um, oh, Laurie. Yes. I wanted to share with you. I recently, and this was a very new experience for me. I did a drawing class for the very first time, and oh. yeah, and it was just an hour session for all these newbies who never, like, we're not artists, but we all kind of came together. And the art teacher in an hour taught us three different techniques, and we just had like our charcoal and some paper, and she said the first technique is called contour drawing and the idea the way she described it was we we're all going to just draw our hand and it was kind of like this blind drawing where you know if you look at your hand and you study your hand without looking at the paper draw how you see your hand and <laughs> it was wonderful because i'm staring at my hand and it was kind of this slow exercise in incorporating mindfulness and when you look at your hand, you're noticing like the contour, right? The lines and maybe some of the indents yeah. and the creases and the fingernails. And I'm really getting into my hand and I'm like, this is amazing. I feel like so artistic and so in tune with like the shapes that I'm making with my fingers. And then I like look and glance and see what I drew on the paper and oh my God, it was a mess. <laughs> but to have that experience of being so, you know, in the present moment, I thought was a really great exercise. The second exercise... Oh, yeah. What was the second one? The second exercise I think you would really enjoy. And again, I've never done this before, but she came behind all of the participants and asked us to put our hands behind our back and she gave us an object. So we did not know what the objects were. And she literally, I think, you know, just went through her house and picked up, you know, anything from a ball of yarn to a spoon to, you know, any sort of random objects from her house, put them in our hands. And we didn't know what the objects were, and we had to use our senses and feel it to figure out like what the shape was, what the textures were, um, trying to get a sense of dimension, and without knowing what the object was, then to draw how we were experiencing 
the like it wasn't the the point wasn't to draw exactly like the flashlight you were holding or to draw what what it was but to draw the experience of you feeling that object and what we noticed was going back to your picasso reference and some of the abstract we had to make these decisions of as i'm drawing this object that i don't know yet what it is what's the position am i drawing it upright is it upside down is it like long ways is yeah. it you know, or are we incorporating all of these perspectives for, you know, kind of that more abstract view? And it was a really interesting exercise that, like, the, all of us newbies, our new drawing team, um, all had a different way of experiencing it. So I thought that was a really neat way, too, to also be mindful and using art as, like, you know, a therapy. So I wanted to share that, too, because it's very in line with everything that you're saying. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Uh, I, I have to do that kind of thing more my my uh art form that i go to uh is writing of course i you know i have a phd in english so i've taught writing all so long and i'm writing my third book now okay and it is it for me it's it's the way i you know i express myself but there your your wonderful teacher uh reminds me of that famous book that uh that really is marvelous. It was a groundbreaking book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Oh, okay. Um, have, you ever, oh. have you ever heard of that? And she, she takes you through these exercises. That, you know, we're, we're so left brain organized. So she wants to shut that off and deal with this more artistic side. Like you draw things upside down or mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to make you think on that right side, like the exercise of, trying to figure out what that thing is in, in, in back of you, exactly. you know, that you're holding. It's, that's all so, so good for us to, exactly. to get us out of the quotidian and the, uh, you know, the, the things we have to do all the time. I think it's very healthy. And, and it, it does remind me philosophically of, um, of Mark Nepo. Do you know Mark Nepo, N-E-P-O? No, I don't. Um, he, he's, he's a guy who had cancer, um, a, a really radical uh, kind of cancer, I believe, in his chest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I forget now, but he nearly died and um, got over it and was convinced that there was a way to comfort and to strengthen uh, cancer patients with his philosophy. And one of his principles, Laura, is that and I did experience this myself. We are not the wound. Mm. We are much more than that. Uh, one of the operations I had in the hospital, and I, I, had, I really had some um, a, a, a rather unusual time. Um, they were operating on me in my hospital room without anesthesia. And I had the feeling of being a, on, on the roof of the, of, the, of the room or on the ceiling. And... And it, it was like a sort of Star Wars thing, but mm. it, I, I never forgot it. And it, it is what he is saying. You are much more than this disease, mm -hmm. this cancerous breast or, or liver or whatever it is. You are a whole world. Mm. And to, to remember <clears throat> that, that, you know, you, you've got to get out of that, I'm, I am this cancer. You are a great rock and roll dancer. You are a wonderful friend. <laughs> yes, exactly. You are a good mother. A, a, you are, you know, a good singer. You can act. You can do all these things. Mm -hmm. It's very healthy. Exactly. And the opposite of that is to be the wound. Mm -hmm. So when I was talking about perspective before, uh, surely the, the Vermeer, when he went into his, in studio he had to forget those 10 children and concentrate on the girl with the pearl or whatever mm -hmm. he was doing yes and that was his help so art does so many things for us uh, in that regard and i think it's great that you're taking this class i'm envious <laughs> <laughs> well i'm learning a lot and i think we tell we have conversations in the community a lot about trying new experiences right and to get out of your comfort zone and try something new and i'm just like you you know we're practicing what we're preaching and you know i wanted to try something i've never done before and 
finding, yeah. you know, joy in that. And it, it was great because I'm no artist, but there was no pressure either. It was just to try something right. new and and get out of my comfort zone and think differently. And what I loved about it too was you're not thinking about cancer, right? You're actually like engaging in a different That's activity right. and you're so ensconced in it that, you know, for that 60 minutes, you know, you're you're present and you're you're there. And that was great. Yeah, well, it, it goes back to the law of attraction. You know, you are what you think about. Yes. And uh, if, you're, if you're constantly worried, and, and, you know, let's face it, with all of the uh, advances in cancer treatment, uh, a lot of the doctors don't know. They, you know, they, they don't know what's going to happen. If they, that's what they say to me, at least. Right. They're not sure. Why am I doing so well uh, w- w- with this stage four? you know, in my, in my lower back, they're not really sure. They just say, Oh, well, your attitude's so great. I, I don't know. Um, but you know, so, so why think about it since we don't know, mm-hmm. let's do other things. Let's embrace our world. Yes. Um, and you know, it would be fun to do, to do a whole podcast on joy. Uh, there's, you know, there's a, a, a fabulous book called the, uh, in fact, I have it here in my office. Uh, it's called Joyful. Okay. And uh, her name is Ingrid Sethel Lee. I'm going to be borrowing some of her ideas. Uh, and what she does is she, it's, she, the subtitle, Laura, is The Surprising Power of Ordinary Things to Create Extraordinary Happiness. Ooh. And so she goes through, you know, all these different surprising things. Uh, from the Japanese custom of going into the into the special woods which has these oak trees, and the people lie down in front of the oak tree, and they get the whatever the pollen or the the oxygen that the the, the tree is generating, mm. they do get a health benefit to something like glitter. Mm-hmm. The, the, you know how kids love glitter. Yep. Uh, well, well, grown-ups do, too. <laughs> of um, course. <laughs> that's a little secret. So she's got about 12 things in here. She, she writes beautifully. Uh, and she goes all around the world to, to ex- ex- explore things like surprise and play mm. and magic. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's, it's really a lovely book. Ingrid Patel Lee. Her last name is Lee. It's joyful. Uh, I would recommend that to, to anyone. Yeah, I'm taking all sorts um, of notes over here. So thank you for all these great recommendations. I will definitely be reading these books. And um, you know, maybe after I read it, we can get back on the podcast and talk more about and debrief about joy. That sounds like, like a great idea. Well, I think you have a natural inclination toward it uh, yes. and, and trust it. Thank you. Uh, that 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 that, one of my messages is uh, trust your own instinct. Mm -hmm. You know the whole thing about authenticity. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Doing a a a drawing class is discovering yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the way you see a hand. You know. Yes. (sighs) And uh, celebrate that. I I I think that's Mm -hmm. I think that's great fun. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the joy topic is, is a rich one, mm-hmm. and it, it has tentacles, you know. Yes, it leads to other, other discoveries. So you mentioned that you, you really believe in, you know, art as healing. We talked a lot about the different types of art and joy and discovery, wonder. What, what are you doing these days? Um, do you... To, to embrace some of these topics? Are you actively going out and trying new adventures? Or you said that you use a lot of writing as your as your art form. Yeah, I, I, uh, I wrote Side Effects, which was an expression of, of uh, you know, all the things I discovered, hopefully to comfort people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big thing I'm doing is the speaking business, which uh, I just started. I belong... <clears throat> 
to the National Speakers Association. This is a real source of joy for me. Okay. Um, the, the New York chapter meets once a month in the city. And I, I live in the country, so it's not always easy to get in. But I love going in. Yesterday, we had our last meeting for, the, <clears throat> for this academic year. And uh, <clears throat> it, it was wonderful. We were at uh, Battery Gardens, and we took a, a, a sale afterwards. But most meetings are so exciting, Laura, because these speakers who make a ton of money, they come in and they tell you their secret. Really? Um, or they, they enchant you. They enchant you. Um, the, the, one guy came in what, a couple months ago. You know, there are about 80, of, well, there are about 100 of us in this chapter. Not everybody shows up every time, once a month. But in this particular one, he came in the door and he did three somersaults. Wow. But he did three somersaults and started speaking. He did magic tricks and he did juggling. I mean, you know, it, these people are so clever mm. and they're, they're so eloquent and they're so generous. Mm. They tell you how they started their business. Mm -hmm. So that is a tremendous source of pleasure to me. When I go to these four-hour meetings, I, I don't, I don't move in my chair. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm just fixed on whatever he's saying to me. So that that's a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is, of course, my my baby, uh, my my son, Mac, my grandson, Mac Weaver, is in Hollywood because my two sons uh, are make movies. Okay. So going going to California from New York is an expensive thing, but I do it as maybe a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. That is a source of joy because my, my whole family's out there, you know. Right. Where are you anyway, Laura, right now? I'm based in Boston. You're, you're in Boston? Yes. I grew up in Chicago and live in Boston. Oh, that's a wonderful town. Yes. Uh, so, so we're both East Coasters. So going to California is my second source of joy. Mm -hmm. I would say... The, you know, to see my brother, my sister-in-law, my niece, my my two sons, their wives, and then my Mac Weaver, my you know, the apple of my eye. Yes. There's only three, but then I'm writing a third book. I wrote Side Effects, and then I did this series of poems called Train Romance. Hmm. Trains give me joy. Um, Old-fashioned trains. That's how I go into the city. Oh. So I wrote I wrote some poetry on this. And what was, I have two colleagues who've written poetry too and taken pictures of train stations. So we have this really lovely um, thing that we're self publishing. So, you know, it's aggravating to do all the details for publishing a book, but when I hold that thing in my hands, I'm going to be so happy. And the third and the fourth thing I'm doing is the third book, which is called Pie to Die For. And it's about living with uh, with this diagnosis, and my husband's crazy client. You know, he's an art appraiser. So he, he goes to people who've lost art and have insured it, and he says he makes money from death, death, divorce, and disaster. Mm. So people either bequeath their art or they lose it through some kind of fire or blood, um, or they... They, get, they go broke and they have to sell their Picasso. Um, uh, so is that death, death? Oh, divorce. Yeah, when they get divorced, they've only got one Rembrandt. How do you split a Rembrandt? Right. Uh, so these are, the, these are the stories. They're short stories of, of these crazy people and what they do. <laughs> so I'm blending the memoir and this business of death, death, divorce, and disaster. Wow. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually, I have a, book coach and we talk once a week and there are two other people on the call like a conference call mm -hmm. and they are so interesting one is the mother of a schizophrenic son oh, oh. I, I was spared that uh, and she is remarkable in her strength he's 30 years old and she's trying to speak to parents who have this sorrow all their lives yeah and the other one is a 
really sassy uh, life coach. Mm. Called, uh, her, her business is called The Unstoppable Life. And she's, she's great. She's never written a book before, and she's really fun. She's really writing to millennials, mm -hmm. to people like my son. So those are the big things. Uh, my husband and I travel. We're going on a cruise on to South America at Christmas time. Um, he's on on some uh, nonprofit boards that are all about art. Mm -hmm. So, and I have this house that I live in. I have twenty thousand books. Yes, five libraries. That's your his, your office. Yeah, I'm looking right second, now. Is beautiful. My second marriage, <laughs> and there's art all over the place. I mean, I, I stumble over everything. So, <laughs> my life is so rich, so rich, mm -hmm. Laura. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Yeah. I, truly, I am. I don't know how I got here. I was a single parent for 20-some years, and uh, I wanted to go on Broadway and do parts for old ladies, you know, mm -hmm. like Sweeney Todd, the, the one in the back with the, with the costume on that doesn't say too much. Right. And then I meet this guy, and we have, we have truly a wonderful life. Oh. I've been smiling for the last hour, Carol. I like your the way that you share your stories. It is it's not happenstance that your life is so rich. It is, you know, I really believe in the power of the universe and what you have cultivated in your mindset and positivity and attitude and being able to find you know, the joy and the happiness in in everything that you're experiencing. I think a lot of times we move so quickly in life that we like you mentioned, like we stumble over things and don't think twice about it. So you know, encouraging people to take that deep breath and not take it for granted that, you know, we blink and we breathe automatically, right? But it's the yes. amazing mechanics of the human body of this gift that we're given. It's so true. So true. Boy, you really are a quick learner or you're, you're my best friend. Yes. <laughs> oh, I feel the same. You understand it all. Yes. Well, Laura. You know, I so appreciate the empathy and the patience to listen to me run on. Uh, but I, I would like to send you my book. I don't know what, you know, maybe you can email me your um, oh, absolutely your address, your snail mail, so I can send it to you. Okay. And uh, and I so appreciate you're inviting me to do my first blog and my first podcast. <laughs> well, absolutely. And I, I know it's on our blog, I believe, too, but for our listeners, where can they go to find your your books and your poems and everything? Is that on Amazon, or is there a website we can direct them? Oh, yeah, definitely the Am Amazon side effects. And I have a really pretty good website. It's www Carol with an E, mm -hmm. Weaver, all lowercase, W E. C A R O L E W E A V is in Victor E R, and then the last name is Linsner, and that's all the same word for the website. L I N is in Nancy, S N is in Nancy E R. So it's Carol Weaver Linsner Linsner dot com, and on that website I have a tour of my home. I've got. Um, my speech when I graduated from Speaker University, which is an NSA uh, product, and a lot of other stuff mm -hmm. uh, where I'm speaking and uh, reviews of the book. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the place to go. And you can email me at uh, uh, Carol Weaver Lindner um, at gmail.com. Thing. This has been such a pleasure, Carol. I can't thank you enough for taking the time, and I'm so glad our paths connected. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast are from personal experiences and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always contact your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. If you like this episode, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, write a review, and leave a comment. It would mean the world to us if you shared the podcast and tagged Breast Cancer Conversations. Chances are, if this resonated with you, it will with others too. Until next time, keep on thriving.
Hey you guys, Laura here. I just wanted to let you guys know if you don't follow us already on YouTube, we do have a survivingbreastcancer.org YouTube channel. We are looking to raise awareness and grow our followers. So if you can hop on over to YouTube, search survivingbreastcancer.org and subscribe, that would be awesome. Our immediate goal right now is to get our first 100 subscribers. So if you want to get in while we are young and new and growing, this is your chance. Thank you.